Good morning, everybody. How are you? Um, just letting everybody sign on now. But feel free to join or to put in the chat box who you are and where you are from. Would love to know where in the world you are joining us from uh, and maybe even what your interest is in learning more about the benefit of exercise uh, in cancer prevention and recurrence. Now, I, I apologize. This is flip-flopped uh, with what we were supposed to be doing today. Um, so forgive me, but I will be doing the CES opportunity tomorrow. I think this is more appropriate anyway to understand kind of the reasoning behind uh, the need for cancer exercise specialists. So um, just looking through the chat box. Hi, Henriette in Atlanta. Thanks for being here. And I am pretty sure you're going through the program and I've seen you on here a couple of times. Hi, Donna in Pennsylvania. Um, wonderful. Uh, we actually, um, we have a Pilates mat handbook that accompanies the cancer exercise specialist. So if you do end up uh, signing up, reach out to me personally and I will give you that uh, at no charge. And anybody else, we'll, we'll just call that a bonus for today. Uh, you guys can mention that to me. Okay, so let's get started. Um, I am Andrea Leonard. I didn't know wait, whether I should wait for this slide. Um, but anyway, I am the president and founder of the Cancer Exercise Training Institute, and maybe more importantly, a 37-year cancer survivor. And Exercise has been an integral part of my recovery. I know that's not what we're talking about today, but I just wanna let you know that it has truly been my salvation. I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer when I was 18 years old. And the thyroid of course affects everything, your metabolism, your energy, your weight, um, to name a few things, but those were the ones that were most important to me at 18 years old. And I struggled with eating disorders and body dysmorphia most of my adult life. In fact, it wasn't too long ago that I, I feel like I truly overcame that. But becoming a personal trainer um, helped me to help myself as well as others. And as I say here, it you know, exercise was free. It's you know the one thing that you don't have to pay huge medical bills or uh, alternative treatments and whatever all somebody has to do is move. And the same thing applies in prevention. For those of you who are either taking the cancer exercise specialist course or intend to, you will see that one of my first slides is this cancer continuum. And it starts with a circle that says prevention and then um, prehab, cancer treatment and recovery. And prevention is so overlooked. I'm not quite sure what, what the issue is. Um, you know, we all know that exercise uh, makes people healthier. It improves the immune system, prevents disease. We know we're supposed to be eating healthy and avoid saturated fats and processed foods and chemicals and pesticides. Yet people continue to uh, make bad choices or not make any choices. And this has led to dis ease. I'm going to use a statistic for the United States uh, when I go through this today. However, I, I think that it, it's wherever you are in the world, we're all dealing with much of the same um, numbers, statistics, that type of thing. Uh, one, one thing I can absolutely say for the United States and having traveled you know, around the world 
is that I, my personal opinion is that we've become a very lazy society and everybody's in a hurry, everybody's in a rush, there's not enough hours in the day. So we take the easy way out on a lot of things, whether it's not taking care of ourselves, not, not exercising, not feeding our kids right, not buying quality foods. And then of course, the other part of that is the cost of good quality, organic, um, you know, naturally uh, sourced products. And so we see in lower socioeconomic areas, a higher incidence of disease. So I want to talk about a study um, fairly recent in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. I think it was, this might have been done in 2019. But as far as studies are, are concerned, that's, that's still pretty recent. Um, it's very hard. It, it has been in the last year with COVID. I've noticed that a lot of the research you know, has, has been kind of put on the back burner. And so we're not getting as, um, we're not getting current information. So this is, this is current. So they looked at uh, whether meeting the current recommended physical activity guidelines actually had an effect on cancer risk. Now, many of you probably think genetics is the number one cause of cancer. So just let's, let's throw this out there and no cheating, don't Google this. What percentage of all cancers do you think are caused by genetics or heredity? Let's see if anybody can answer that one. I'll give you a second on that. Well, uh, I let you know that this was a, a very um, intense and comprehensive study that was con conducted by the American Cancer Society, uh, the National Cancer Institute, and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. So very notable. Um, I don't see any answers, so I'm going to have to give it to you. Five to 10% of all cancers are related to genetics, which means that 90 to 95% are from lifestyle choices and what we call oxidative stress. And these are changes that can take place uh, over a lifetime that can change your DNA from everything from the food and drink that you consume to the products that you use, the air you breathe, um, you name it, you know, whether you smoke, whether you don't smoke, whether you exercise, whether you don't exercise. So you've got genetic and then you've got somatic changes, which are changes that happen over time. So going back to my, my little circle and starting with prehab, if we could start by educating people and educating them more, pushing them, pushing your loved ones, your family members, your friends to, to be an advocate for their own health, you know, get up and move. I think one of the most common, um, I guess, perceptions is that you have to do X number of exercise for it to have any benefit. And obviously there are recommendations. So um, the American College of Sports Me Medicine recommends 150 minutes of moderate intensity or 75 minutes of high intensity exercise uh, in, in the prevention of cancer. So 150 minutes, my God, that sounds absolutely overwhelming to someone who doesn't exercise. Two and a half hours is much more palatable in my book, but why not suggest that if people could do six times a day, five minutes, five times a week, or you know, break it down into smaller bite-sized chunks that people can wrap their brains around, um, especially if somebody just doesn't like exercise. The other part of that is finding exercise that they can like. And even gardening, which we'll, we'll talk about in one of these slides, has been shown to have some positive effect. Um, you know, obviously, I guess it depends on how vigorous your gardening skills are. But nonetheless, any movement is better than no movement. And that goes for cancer prevention, that goes during treatment, and well into recovery and survivorship. Like I said, I'm using the statistic, which is the United States, but I think that if we looked at a lot of, a lot of places around the world, it would be the same situation. Not all, um, you know, there are countries having been to um, the Netherlands a couple of times and, and in Amsterdam, everybody's riding their bikes. Uh, there's very little uh, automobile traffic. And I mean, they have parking lots filled with bicycles. So a very active society. And not to say we're not active in the United States, but I think, um, 
it's just a different mentality and all we, you know, it's work, 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 and not enough hours in the day and taking care of your kids and trying to work up the corporate ladder. And what we're seeing is that less than a fourth, a quarter of Americans are getting the recommended amount of physical activity each week. And so what, what that's leading to is more disease, not just cancer, but um, you know, heart disease, diabetes, anything in which the immune system is basically breaking down. And this can also be caused from inflammation. So if you think of oxidative stress, um, and, and that is what I, what I mentioned a minute ago with changes to the DNA that happen over a lifetime from these external um, influences uh, or internal, if it's something that we're ingesting, and add that, that causes inflammation. And that can also lead to infection, which then leads to things like cancer. So we know for a fact that keeping active can help people lose weight or at least maintain a healthy weight. Now, I'm not talking about looking like a runway model. Um, we're just talking about a healthy weight. And that is also looking at body composition. So it's not so much what the scale says because even my uh, BMI, body mass index. I remember uh, being in the doctor's office and the nurse, you know, asked what my weight was. And of course, when you're lifting weights, you're heavier, right? So without even looking at me, she tells me I'm borderline obese. And I said, turn around, you know, and, and we both got a laugh out of that. But I just want you to know that I'm, I'm not talking about fitting into someone else's standards. We're, we're looking at a healthy body composition. And this is linked to a reduction or a reduced rate of 13 different types of cancer. Now I'm only gonna mention a few because otherwise we'd be here all day. But what are the benefits of being active? Most of us have a general idea, um, but let's just assume that uh, somebody in this audience does not have any clue. Let's talk about the basics. One of the most important is improving immune health, strengthening your immune system. Your immune system is responsible for protecting your body against infection and other harmful agents. When it is not working effectively or properly, you are more susceptible to anything, you know, whether it be the common cold or the flu or something like cancer. So a strong immune system is critical and this you know, we talk about this pretty much daily uh, over the past year with COVID and those people with a strong immune system um, seem to perhaps have more resistance to it. I don't think we really know exactly what's going on, but we know that if you have a strong immune system, you're less likely to get the cold uh, or the flu. So that's just a fact. Uh, and that's a combination of diet, exercise, mental health, stress management, and getting adequate sleep. These are all things that are overlooked by so many of us, whether we do it purposely or there just are not enough hours in the day. And I am absolutely guilty of that. So being active is going to help us maintain a healthy weight. Notice, you know, it doesn't say uh, a certain weight, a specific weight, a skinny weight, just a healthy weight. It also improves mood. So if you've ever been, uh, me yesterday, not even to put it out there rhetorically. I was just in a mood yesterday, um, just kind of a funk, a little bit sad, a little bit gloomy. It was raining here, number of things going on. And I didn't really want to, but I grabbed my dog and went for a walk. And I started off, you know, listening to this melancholy music that was making me more sad. And then I put on some you know, fun, energetic music. And I just started looking at all the flowers and the trees and how beautiful life is. And before too long, I started to feel better. And after an hour of, of walking, um, it, it, it was like I was completely invigorated. So it is a fact, the endorphins that we produce when we're exercising make us feel better. It's like a happy pill without actually having to take a pill. And that's why they call it the runner's high. So this will help also reduce stress. And stress is, there, there's a big correlation with stress and cancer. Um, you know, I don't know that, I, I'm sure there are studies that have been done. I don't know if they can say precisely, you know, this level of stress is going to cause you to get cancer, but, but 
having worked with hundreds of cancer patients over the last uh, two and a half decades, I can't tell you how many people told me they were going through a divorce. Uh, they had a loss of a loved one. There was some stressful period uh, at, at work that kind of led to them getting cancer. So is it a, a strong correlation? Is it coincidence? Who knows? But we know that stress wreaks havoc on your body and your mental health. Exercise is going to help reduce the risk of heart disease. Now here's a little uh, tidbit. If someone is going through chemotherapy and, and we're future tripping here now, we're not talking about prevention, we're talking about people with cancer, um, chemotherapy as well as radiation therapy can actually damage the heart and the lungs. So, you know, here we can start to strengthen the heart before somebody gets cancer, hopefully they never get cancer, um, during that initial phase of, of prehab, preparing them to go through treatment and then in recovery. So really exercise has its role all throughout the cancer continuum. Reduced risk of dementia. One of the things that I incorporate in my own training, as well as that of working with clients, is doing things like counting forward and, and backward, um, doing sequences and then, and then changing them up or repetition, um, balance, you know, physically balancing, um, trying to work all of the different neurological components as well as just building muscle strength and endurance. And, you know, it's just getting more bang for the buck, if you will. Um, reduced depression, I think that kind of goes hand in hand with improving mood and reducing stress. We've seen huge numbers of, um, I hate to bring up suicide, but this year, a uh, lot of people going on antidepressants, marriage is falling apart, poor health. It's been a very difficult year for everybody around the world. And I don't know if people have used, you know, being at home um, and in, in some cases quarantined as an opportunity to take better care of themselves. Some people may have used it as not, not an opportunity, but as an excuse to you know, eat bad, not exercise, watch a lot of Netflix. And I think I've done both through the year. I'm, I'm on the good side of things right now. Another thing is just the aging population alone. Uh, first off, they have a higher risk of osteoporosis, which is also compounded by those who go through cancer treatment, for example, with chemotherapy. Um, but as we age, we have a higher risk of osteoporosis. And when women go through menopause, uh, the risk goes up even more. If men or women or are on hormonal therapy for cancer, the risk is elevated. And so you've got decrease in bone density, more difficulty with balance. And then when people fall, they have a higher risk of injury. So it's not just being active, but it's choosing the appropriate type of activities for the person who is doing the exercising. You know, your mother's workout should be different than your workout, than your child's workout, depending on where someone is at in life. And so therefore, in some instances, um, you know, the emphasis may be more on balance work than on cardiovascular training or more on strength training than balance work. We really have to look at what someone's needs are, but know that all of these together, um, you know, all these different types of exercise are, are going to have multiple benefits. And the biggest one, at least for the purposes of this presentation are to reduce the risk of cancer. So among women, more physical activity was associated with up to 10 to 20% lower risk for breast cancer. Most of the studies indicate that this is with postmenopausal women. So we're looking, you know, usually upward of 50 something, but that's not to minimize the benefit of exercise for those that are premenopausal or even perimenopausal. I have um, a number of people in my life that I know who were diagnosed with breast cancer after getting uh, in vitro fertilization and um, you know multiple times and estrogen surging through the bodies. And there is definitely a correlation with hormones and breast cancer. And there's a correlation with a number of different types of cancer as, well, as we will mention. So um, how can exercise 
help to prevent breast cancer? Well, for one, the, the reducing the amount of body fat can actually help to manage hormone levels. And the two biggies are estrogen and insulin. So these can both actually fuel breast cancer. When someone produces a lot of insulin um, for, for various reasons, it can also trigger the production of human growth hormone. Now, human growth hormone is not selective. It's going to cause division, uh, you know, cell division, cell growth, whether they're cancerous cells or healthy cells. So therefore, um, if there are, can all of us have cancer cells just kind of in hibernation. It's just looking for that trigger. And so if there's a surge of insulin, if insulin is out of control, people have insulin resistance, they're type two diabetes uh, or you know, type one is not so much insulin resistance, there is no insulin production at all. All of these things can contribute to someone's risk of breast cancer. And this goes along with other lifestyle choices as well. So the definition of cancer is when cells, basically the, the mechanism that controls the cell's growth goes awry and the cells multiply out of control. So maintaining healthy weight and being physically active can reduce the levels of estrogen and insulin in the body. And, you know, a lot of this, you're probably going to feel like I'm saying the same thing over and over. And in many ways I am, but, you know, with different references. And sometimes it takes hearing something 21 times before we are ready to make a change, good or bad. Um, you may have found yourself getting into some bad habits over the last year. I know I have. And now I'm like, okay, I've done this more than 21 times. It's, it's time to turn back the clock and make some more positive changes changes. So according to the National Cancer Institute, most physically active adults can reduce their risk of colon cancer by as much as 24%. That's huge. That is absolutely huge. And when you look at various types of cancer, um, you know, and, and feel free to share if, if you're so inclined, whether, you know, you yourself have, have gone through or are going through cancer, or you have a loved one, family member, friend, um, usually that's what prompts people to be interested in this. I don't think it's just something that sounds really super fun to learn about, but um, some have better prognoses than others. And breast cancer when caught early can have a 97% cure rate, which is fantastic. And that's why, you know, doing self exams and going for your mammograms, all of these, you know, proactive and preventative things are, are critical. And same thing with having, um, you know, regular colon checkups, which I don't think are generally started until you are, I want to say above 50. But, you know, if there are any reasons that you suspect something to be out of whack, if you will, um, not right, go see your doctor. And, and I tell you this as a 37 year cancer survivor, as someone who's worked with hundreds of cancer patients that were misdiagnosed, um, maybe they went to the doctor because they had you know, some peculiar side effect and the doctor said, oh, don't worry about it. Let's watch, let's wait. And that watching and waiting caused the cancer to go to a later stage with not as good of a prognosis. So be very proactive, whether it's a lump in your breast or something is wrong with your bowel movements. Uh, you've got a lump anywhere in your body. If something is wrong, you are in charge of your own health and you need to, you know, follow through and get all the tests you need to rule out whatever it is you're concerned about. I go off on these little tangents because I think these things are really important. Another study, so uh, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute uh, conducted the study and tracked 1,200 patients that were already diagnosed with colon cancer, and they found a 19% decline in the risk for early death. And that's just doing 30 minutes or more a day of moderate activity. Now, keep in mind also that moderate, high intensity, low intensity, this is all relative because what's moderate to me might be high intensity to my 83 year old mother. And what's um, low intensity to my 20 year old daughter might be high intensity for me. So this is all relative. And I'm gonna say it again, I don't care what people are doing 
as long as they're out there moving. Yes, I'm going to encourage more and I'm going to gradually mentally and physically prepare them for more exercise, but let's just get people moving. So four to five hours of moderate activity, and that sounds like a lot, but what if we include things like gardening or you know, walking around in nature, walking on the beach, swimming, you know, things that are, are really enjoyable, even tourism. Um, you know, if, if people are going to tour the castles of Ireland or Scotland, this is all active and they are also getting a cultural experience as well. So we can kind of disguise exercise in there. Um, even light housekeeping, that the benefit went from 19% to 25%. Now, if you were diagnosed with colon cancer and were told you had less than five years to live, I think uh, you know decreasing that or increasing that, whichever way you're looking at it, by 25% is uh, pretty appealing. And, and you know, this is just a sampling. 1,200 people is really not that large of a sampling. You know, when you look at other studies with thousands and, or in, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of people. But nonetheless, um, studies continue to be conducted. And every year, it seems like we get a little bit closer to honing in on what exactly is the reason behind uh, the efficacy of you know, exercise as uh, a mediating factor for breast cancer versus thyroid cancer or esophageal cancer. And right now they've honed in on 13 types of cancer that there are definite correlations with exercise. So how can exercise actually help to prevent colon cancer? Well, think about this. If you've ever been constipated um, or even gone, you know, a day or, or two of not going to the bathroom, everything that you've eaten in that time frame is still inside, in contact with the mucosal lining of your stomach. So over time, as that breaks down, it can become carcinogenic. Exercise generally speeds digestion. And speaking from experience, I know that, you know, if I get out there and jump around and, and bounce around on a trampoline, it's not too long before nature calls. So if we can get people moving, we get their bowels moving as well, that may prevent this uh, long-term contact with these uh, potential carcinogens. Trying to, trying to word it in such a way that it's not disgusting. <laughs> so um, now a Yale School of Public Health study found that women who exercised at least 150 minutes weekly had a 34% reduced risk of endometrial cancer compared with their sedentary peers. 34%. I mean, the numbers, you know, are, are increasingly um, more convincing. But I think that so many people, and I am so guilty of this, think, you know, I'll worry about it when it happens to me. And there's still benefits to be had for beginning an exercise programming once you're diagnosed with cancer, but I think we would all be prudent in doing things to prevent cancer from ever happening because there are no guarantees once you've got cancer. Um, you know, you hope for the best and you do everything you can to um, re reduce cell growth and, and minimize uh, the risk of metastasis or spreading to other parts of the body, but it, it's not the, not the best way to go about it. So when we look at the body mass index, along with activity levels, women who were active and had a BMI of 25% or less. So 25 is that kind of breaking point. That's, I think I was at like 24% when they told me I was obese. Um, they showed an even greater reduction, 73%. So if that is not evidence to show that maintaining a healthy body composition is critical, in the prevention, at least here with uh, you know endometrial cancer, I don't know what is. And women who are a normal weight but inactive, so we're looking at all all different sides of the coin here, had a 55% lowered risk, where women who were overweight and active had a 38% risk. So just a number of different ways that that we can look at this. But all in all, and you, this is going to be a repeat slide. 
Uh, the same with breast cancer. You know, we're looking at female reproductive hormones, primarily estrogen, but the combination of estrogen and insulin. And although this says fuel breast cancer growth, like I said, exact exact copy of the slide, it also has the same effect with endometrial cancer. Now there's another study that was conducted by the Mayo Clinic, and you'll notice that these names that I'm dropping are all preeminent cancer research hospitals and centers. So these are not just, uh, you know, on, on some random website or, um, you know, somebody who is irrelevant uh, giving their opinion. These are all very valid studies. Um, this shows that exercise reduces the risk of dying from lymphoma. So lymphoma is cancer of the lymphatic system. And this of course being, um, uh, I, I talked about the immune system. So being part of the immune system and what protects our body against infection and arm, other harmful agents, it's like a filter. And so when it is not working properly, it's going to affect our ability to fight off infection or disease. And people confuse lymphoma with cancer that has spread to the lymph nodes. That's completely different. So if I had thyroid cancer, it got into my lymph nodes and it spread to my liver. It's still thyroid cancer. It doesn't become lymphoma. So I just want to differentiate that for you. So this particular team discovered that patients who exercise more before a diagnosis survived longer when they developed lymphoma than those that were less active to begin with. So that was the first point. And they found that those who stepped up or increased their exercise after a lymphoma diagnosis had better survival rates than those who remained less active. Now this all sounds great, but when you're going through chemo or radiation or hormonal therapy and you have mind numbing fatigue, you know, for those people who didn't exercise before, they're not very motivated to start exercising when they're feeling worse than they've ever felt. And I think this is where, particularly as a cancer exercise specialist, the encouragement and the safety net that I can provide and, and just you know be their mentor, be their coach, just get them moving. And you really need to understand what is too much and what is not enough or what is good enough. And going back to that balance of um, strength training, flexibility, range of motion, literal balance training, cardiovascular, meditation, all of these things have to be part of a, a comprehensive exercise program, but we need to know the proper combinations and it's all different you know, prevention is going to be very different than prehab, than during cancer treatment and into recovery. And we as health and fitness professionals have to take on that responsibility of understanding all of these intricacies before we can safely prescribe exercise. And even though, you know, that, that sounds like, well, why do I need to prescribe exercise? Anybody can exercise, but it, it's called exercise science for a reason, because you've got to look at the science behind it, especially when you're dealing with people who have comorbidities um, that go along with their cancer diagnosis. You have to understand all the intricacies of those as well. So there was another recent exercise in cancer study that showed working out lowers the risk of a person developing non-Hodgkin lymphoma. So there's Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin. Non this is particularly um, addressing non-Hodgkin. This is a big lengthy title, the Department of Cancer Control Research at the British Columbia Cancer Agency and the School of Population and Public Health at the University of British Columbia in Canada. I'll give credit where credit is due. Found that people who reported more vigorous and intense physical activity in their lifetime, so the entire lifetime, had between 25 to 30% lower risk for non-Hodgkin lymphoma when compared to those who reported the least lifetime amount of activity. So if I haven't convinced you yet, not that you came here needing convincing, uh, but the evidence is there, right? I mean, I've just given you a bunch of studies and are any of you guys out there personal trainers or group exercise instructors. Um, I would love to know the audience here so I can help tailor this to you. You know, are you working with cancer patients? 
Amanda, I don't know uh, because we are in a webinar setting. I don't know. I don't think you can unmute. You can try it, but I don't think it will allow you to. So you may have to write your question in the chat box, which I'm trying to open and it just disappeared. Gotta love it. Um, okay, she, you just said, okay. So go ahead and write in the chat box. If you wanna write it privately, you can you know, change that. Uh, otherwise it's going to all panelists. So I, I just, I hope this isn't morose, but I really thought this was a cool little cartoon. What fits your busy schedule better? Exercising an hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day. And sometimes it is being that candid with somebody. And I'm not saying that you should say this to your clients if you're a personal trainer or if you're a physical therapist, your patients. Um, but yeah, you know, if, if this is my father and he's smoking and that was my father and he passed away. He had three different types of cancer and smoked till the day he died. And quite frankly, my, my snide sense of humor didn't have any effect on him because he just was that person that wasn't going to change. So we can't change everybody's way of thinking. And, um, you know, we're, we're not going to impact everyone we love. But if we make a difference in one person's life, then I think it's worth it. Um, so Adrian, you're asking if you're not already a trainer, would I have to get an additional certification to complement the CETI training? So here is the answer to that. We recommend strong recommendation that you have a background in health or fitness, whether that is a college degree or a certification. We do make exceptions. And so what I would suggest to you is to email me personally at Andrea at thecancerspecialist.com and we can discuss your personal background um, and how we can help you uh, to become part of this team. Because the fact of the matter is that we've got 50 million people living with cancer around the world and that there are absolutely not enough people, even with the thousands of people we've trained to be cancer exercise specialists in 43 countries, there are not enough of us. So in a way, this is a, a desperate plea to have more health and fitness professionals get on board to work with this population. And just raising your hand and saying, yeah, count me in isn't enough. You've got to get the education. Um, thanks for sharing, y'all. I'm seeing, you know, personal training, NASM trainer, group exercise, um, and breast cancer survivors. So thank you for, for sharing. Um, it certainly helps me to be able to address what, what your specific needs or desires might be being a part of this webinar today. Um, like I said, there are 50 million people living with cancer. Now that doesn't include the millions of newly diagnosed cancer patients every single year. And so here's the good and the bad. The numbers of people diagnosed with cancer are not going down. They continue to go up. And I think we're gonna have to make some dramatic changes uh, environmentally and in lifestyle before we ever see the numbers go down and it may not happen in our lifetime. The plus is that people are living longer. They are surviving cancer. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that, early detection, better treatment, uh, better treatment tolerance, because if people can't withstand the side effects of any given treatment, then obviously the treatment doesn't have the ability to work, right? Um, but by 2030, these numbers are gonna just go up exponentially. And so we need, you know, tens of thousands of cancer exercise specialists that can be in every corner of every town, every city, every state, every country around the world. So many of you have asked uh, these questions. So I just wanna address this. There are a number of ways you can do this. You can do self-paced study and you can do the cancer exercise specialist or just the breast cancer recovery BOSU specialist. Although I encourage that more as an add-on than a primary uh, certification because you're gonna get so much more in the cancer exercise specialist. Uh, we cover 27 types of cancer. We go through all the surgeries, treatments, side effects. It's 500 pages of material, um, 39 quizzes, a final exam, 37 um, videos, very, very comprehensive. So that's one option. And you can do that at your own pace over the course of six months. The other is starting uh, next week, I have a live virtual training that 
I am doing together with my marketing guru, Greg Hendrickson. So not only are you getting some help with the studying process, and I'll really take you through somewhat of a fast track going through the course, you'll still have that six months, but many people find it helpful to have that interaction with me and other people in the group. And the, the pricing is, is, is very comparable. Um, you're not paying a whole lot more to get all of this extra help. Plus you're getting three sessions with Greg and then uh, an individual coaching session with him. So what we really want to do, we don't want to just give you this piece of paper. Yeah, you're a cancer exercise specialist. That's great. We want to help you get out there. We're going to add you to our international directory and we want to give you some business skills so that you can position yourself as the next step in the healthcare continuum. So you're going to get your continue, continuing education from ACE, AFA, CanFit Pro, SimSpa, NSCA, NASM, uh, 22 non-contact hours from Yoga Alliance, and you can petition for any others. But this applies to all health and fitness professionals. You don't have to be just a personal trainer. You could be group exercise, yoga, Pilates. You may be a PT or an OT. Uh, maybe you're a nurse. Maybe you're a doctor. What I teach you is how to apply whatever your modality is to working with cancer patients at all stages of the cancer journey. So um, you can reach out to me individually at Andrea at thecancerspecialist.com. Happy to answer any questions for you. You can go directly to the website if you'd like, and then use the code live train all caps 21 uh, to get our special pricing. And this will work for the cancer exercise specialist, the breast cancer recovery BOSU specialist, um, as well as this live virtual training. So I really, I want to thank you for, you know, spending this part of your morning with me. I know everybody's got busy schedules and there aren't, aren't enough hours in the day. So I hope that this was insightful for you and I will be doing, uh, we'll flip flop it around tomorrow. I'll be doing the cancer exercise training opportunity. So to give you a little more in-depth look at what it's like to be a cancer exercise specialist and what the opportunities are for you. So if you have any questions, um, I'll stick around for a minute and happy to answer them. Uh, alternatively, like I said, you can email me at Andrea at thecancerspecialist.com and I will definitely get right back to you. Thanks, Maureen. Thanks, thanks for being here today. And Evelyn, Henriette, Maureen, Amanda, going through the list here. Um, I know we've got people from around the world, so I, it may be uh, tomorrow, it may be the middle of the night. So thank you for taking the time to be here today. And I don't see any questions, so I'm gonna let you guys go, but uh, feel free to reach out to me. And I hope to see some of you next week in the live training. Have a great day and stay safe and healthy. <laughs>